her and start one aspect of my field study in Ganesh Puri in India. Um, it was an amazing trip in so many ways. I actually wasn't expecting it to be so amazing. Um, having done international field work before, um, my experience has been like I end up somewhere and uh, things are wild and crazy, not what I expected, and I go home with a lot less than I thought I would. Um, but in this case, uh, things were wild and crazy and un unexpected. And I went home with so many more experiences and observations than I, I thought I was going to. Um, and as I sit and reflect on all of the things that I saw, uh, more and more uh, interesting thoughts and ideas keep coming to mind. So thank you so much, Kara, for um, helping me do this. So uh, the title of the slideshow today is called Shakti, which is the door to Shiva. And this is a verse that is coming out of what is called the Viyana Bhairava Tantra, or the Tantra of um, the all-knowing Bhairava. And here is the, the, the actual verse, which says that one, when one enters the state of Shakti, who, or, or that is one who is identical with Shakti, there ensues a feeling of non-distinction between Shakti and Shiva. Then he acquires the state of Shiva, for in the Agamas, which means the sacred scriptures, Shakti is declared as the door um, of entrance into Shiva. You know, in some scriptures, it says the face of Shiva. Just as by means of the light of a lamp and the rays of the sun, portions of space are known, even so, O oh dear one, by means of Shakti is Shiva, who is one's own essential self. So a little cryptic, um, but there's a lot of symbolic metaphoric sig significance to Shakti. Shakti is a lot of things. Shakti is the, the divine mother, the great goddess. Shakti is also the, the energy that permeates all of the seen and unseen world. So what this quote is essentially saying, this verse is essentially saying is that in order to achieve self-realization, which is analogized as Shiva, the great Lord, um, the gateway to that realization is through Shakti and that Shakti is, can be seen um, and also felt. And so this trip was an opportunity for me to to see, experience, and understand how Shakti is seen and felt in the Trika tradition uh, at Ganesh Puri, which is one of the uh, sort of the bedrocks of uh, modern day Shaiva Tantra yoga. Okay, so today I'm going to try to get through as much of this as possible. Uh, give you guys a little bit of over, overview. I don't want to spend, I could spend literally months talking on overview um, because there is so much. It's, um, it's a, a very, very old tradition. So I wanted to uh, abbreviate a lot of stuff when I talk about the overview and really just limit it to the things that I know and the things that I'm researching. So for those of you that are very conversant in the Trika tradition, just know that um, I'm if I leave something out that you think is important, please interrupt me and uh, add on. Um, I would welcome that. Uh, and a little bit of the uh, Trika Tantra, just what are some of the, the metaphysical underpinnings, um, ontologies of Trika Tantra that uh, give more meaning to that quote or that verse that I just spoke about? Why is it that in Tantra we seek liberation through embodiment and through feeling and through earth and through each other? Um, and then looking at how this has come down to us in modern times, who are some of the foremost teachers, lineage holders, um, and how it's practiced today, or that also how it's understood today, which will take us into kind of the, what I hope to be the, the bulk of today's presentation, which is gonna be looking at Shakti as manifested in a variety of ways. And there are four primary means for Shakti to express itself. Um, this is what I observed on my, during my field study, during my time in Ganesh Puri. And that first means is through guru, uh, the teacher. The second is through place or through pilgrimage, through image and materiality. And then finally through the individual self. Okay, so let us begin. So this is uh, Ganesh Puri. Um, and I think that, uh, Kathleen, you you've been you said that you spent a significant amount of time here. So this is um, from what I heard from several people. It's sort of like the land that time forgot in the best way possible, meaning that it hasn't really changed much. 
Um, this has long been known as a pilgrimage site for Siddha Yoga, which is Muktananda Siddha Yoga. The main ashram is there. Um, but beyond just Muktananda's lineage, uh, there are several lineages that have come from uh, a, the saint from the earliest 20th century named Bhagwan Nityananda. Uh, and from what I've read, this is one of the most popular pilgrimage locations for Westerners around the world. Um, some people come with more of a tantric orientation towards Nityananda's teachings, and some people definitely have more of a devotional or a bhakti approach to uh, engaging with this tradition. All right, and so here's just another, um, this is something I just saw every day and it kind of uh, is just a sweet little picture of Ganesh Puri. <laughs> okay, so uh, when I went into this, I, I didn't quite yet have a thesis statement um, but I definitely had a research question. And I wanted to understand and interrogate the way Shakti moves between different cultures and different locations. Uh, having studied Shakti traditions um, and more recently Trika Shaiva Tantric traditions uh, in the United States, it was going to be interesting for me to understand where there are convergences and where things kind of um, aren't lining up. Um, and that was a big question for me. Uh, I also wanted to know how the, this movement of Shakti is contingent upon the, the individual practitioner's ability to connect to the source of Shakti, which means through pilgrimage. And this is a pilgrimage site. Um, and uh, soon I'll quote Dr. Sharma, who's with us today. Um, about the immersive experience. How does the immersive experience enable one to more deeply understand a uh, tradition cross-culturally? And one of my uh, many arguments is that in order for this to happen, we need to have um, aesthetic absorption in a particular tradition, which is facilitated by visual culture, materiality, ritual, sound, all of these things. And on the right here, we see um, a modern rendering of Para Shakti, who is the um, tutelary deity for the Trika Shaiva tradition. Okay, the immersive experience. Um, and Dr. Sharma, feel free to jump in if I, if I screw up your theory here. Uh, so the, the photo on the right that you see here is taken during um, the once weekly Palki procession or the Guru procession. This is at the very end we see um, a young man here drumming and um, an older woman here who is uh, chanting uh, in a celebratory manner for Guru Nityananda. And so Dr. Sharma says that, uh, what, what is the immersive experience? And she's saying here that immersion signifies the experience of a religious tradition, not only in terms of its outward facing expression, but in terms of the interior understanding of practitioners. This can be achieved through critical engagement with its sacred texts and religious thought via contemplative and performative encounters, which may embrace sacred sound, music, meditation, ritual, dance, pilgrimage, the use of visual and material culture, or participation in other facets of praxis. In the case of religions that are oriented toward theopraxis, which the Trika most certainly is, experiencing sacred texts and their theologies through embodied practice, Deep understanding is possible less through dialogue and more so through immersion. Indeed, such encounters provide opportunities for wordless dialogue wherein one knows the other via entering into the meaningful revelatory space of praxis redolent with mystery, very um, poetically articulated. Um, and this is what I was going for when I uh, went to Ganesh Puri to find this immersive experience. Uh, and there are, th there are three primary ways in which the immersive experience uh, availed itself to me. And obviously the first one is pilgrimage. You kind of have to go there. Um, the second would be sadhana or practice and not just one particular kind of practice, but a range of tantric practices from meditation, um, in some cases mantra to just really uh, visiting holy sites is also a form of sadhana. Uh, and along with that, visual and material culture acting as aids to um, bring about this experience. Uh, and the image you see here on the right hand side is of a Shivalinga at the Atmalingeshwar Mandir uh, in a 
in a town a little bit away from Ganesh Puri, but nonetheless a very popular pilgrimage site for people that go there. Uh, and there are many mini shrines, and this was from one mini shrine, but I'll talk more about that later. Um, this was just happened to be one of my, my favorite shrines that I visited. It's quite beautiful. Okay, so what is Trika Tantra? So first of all, um, and several scholars um, have argued for this, um, including David Lawrence, uh, is that it is, many people refer to Trika, Trika Tantra as Trika Shaivism. And it is probably better termed as a form of Shakta Shaivism because the, the primary focus for practitioners of Trika Tantra is on Shakti. And Shakti takes the form of the triune goddess who is Para, Para Para, and A Para, A Para. And Para is the sort of supreme ultimate reality. And as we move down the line here with goddess, with the, um, the names of the goddesses, uh, they're, I don't know quite how to, how to articulate this, um, the scope of their power is not quite as absolute. It is a little bit more limited, but it just, it shows the, the range of Shakti's power, how she can evolve and manifest on many planes of reality simultaneously. It is um, a non-dual path of bipolarity, meaning that uh, in order to achieve non-dual consciousness, which is understood as liberation, uh, different poles of reality, which we see as two, are eventually understood as being one. And I've just listed a, a few here um, that would be most familiar, Shiva and Shakti, uh, the Divine Lord uh, and Shakti, the, the Divine Feminine, Transcendence and Immanence, Material and Immaterial are, are all parts and everything in between them is part of the greater whole. A uh, third aspect of this tradition is that it is um, a, a guru shishya or a guru disciple tradition, meaning that its teachings are made available to people through oral transmission, directly from teacher to student through a long parampara or through a long lineage. And this is uh, typically how the tradition is carried on. Even though we have a large corpus of texts in Trika Tantra, um, those texts need to be contextualized uh, by an adept. On the left-hand side here, you see the what is called the yantra of uh, Trika Tantrism. And this is, let's go back. It's actually uh, analogous to this iconography here of Parashakti. And you will see some very similar symbols evident. You see Shiva's trident, you see the lotus, uh, and you see, you can't see it so much in this one, but if she were 3D, she would be sitting on that, um, that square uh, shape on the bottom. Okay, so two other aspects of the Trika tradition is that uh, the, the Kula or the Kaula, the family or the group um, is defined in part by how egalitarian it is, meaning that uh, Unlike certain other traditions, not just uh, in Hinduism, but in every single culture, uh, liberation and initiation is not restricted um, to anyone uh, based on gender or social class. Uh, everybody is able to reach liberation and become initiated. It is still, however, hierarchical, um, and that is in part because of the nature of the, the guru shishya relationship is that those with larger amounts of knowledge and understanding bestow that knowledge onto those who uh, don't have so much yet. It is a form of orthopraxis, um, meaning that the epistemology is textually and experientially based. So we find the truth here in the, in the Trika tradition uh, based on our own experience, and this experience is verified through the agamas or the tantras, the sacred scriptures of the tantra. This picture here uh, speaks a lot to both of these things. In the center here, you see the, that same para kundalini para shakti yantra that you saw in black and white in the previous slide. Here you see it as um, a three-dimensional formation being used for the construction of her, her energy inside the body. 
And on the bottom here, you see little photographs of all of the members in the lineage um, of which Shiva is, is the root guru, the main guru. Okay, so modern Trika, we start to get now more into um, the research that, that I am currently engaging in and what I started to engage in in India. And we're looking at a lineage tradition here that starts with Nityananda and moves all the way down to Swami Kecharanatha, who is now in Berkeley, California. Um, and I realized that this is a very abbreviated representation of this lineage. There are so many more teachers here, but like I said, I had to make um, some major choices in terms of presentation because I really did want to get to the, um, the good stuff, what I, what I looked at in India. So I'm just going to kind of run through this uh, pretty quickly. So the, the main lineage holder here is a saint called Bhagavan Nityananda, the saint of Ganesh Puri. Um, and it should be stated outright that Nityananda never claimed to be a tantrika or anything else. Um, he did not identify with, with any religious sect in Hinduism or outside of it. Um, he is known as what is called a Janma Siddha, one who is born realized. Um, sometimes these people are referred to as Avaduta, uh, which means that it's a person who spontaneously manifests um, mastery of self-knowledge. Uh, the biographies that we have of Nityananda uh, could be or could be qualified as hagiography or a sacred story of a saint. Nothing was really written down. Very little is known. Uh, in some sources, say that his life is like a is like a Puranic myth mixed with history. Um, what we do know is that uh, he, at a at a very young age, as a baby. Uh, he was raised by a lawyer named Ishwar Iyer. There are different takes on what happened to his parents. Some say that he was abandoned in a field. Other stories say that uh, his parents were actually servants of this particular lawyer. Um, and just like most Avadut, he, from a young age, he exhibited a lot of proclivities toward the inner life, the spiritual life. He always exhibited a profound love for God and left home at a very, very early age to search for realization. Um, and so he began walking, I think as a teenager, and after many years made his way up to Maharashtra in Ganesh Puri. So we see some lovely images of him here. And by the time he gets to Maharashtra, uh, he's been taken care of by a group of uh, people called the Adivasis, and these are the tribal people of India. And he's gained a reputation um, as he sort of worked his way up uh, to this part of the country. And within a few years, you can see what's going on here. He's just flanked by, by mostly children. They start to follow him around. People start following him around because of his, because of his Shakti. All right, and so his primary lineage holder, I'm sure many of you recognize this guy. Um, his reputation goes without saying, for those of you who are familiar uh, with modern Hindu tradition, Swami Muktananda, the father of Siddha Yoga. Uh, I'll spend less time on his biography, even though it's extremely interesting. Uh, he came from a, a very wealthy family. So in, in many cases, his upbringing in almost every case, actually, his upbringing was very different than Nityananda's. And met Nityananda at a young age as Nityananda was walking through his village in the south um, in Mangalore and fell blissfully in love with him. And ended up, as a, as a young man, he studied with a lot of uh, Vedantic swamis. He was already on the path to becoming a, a sannyasi and ended up working his way back to Muktananda and was told by another Baba or another Sadhu that if he wanted to find liberation in this life, his freedom would be found with Swami Nityananda. So at that point, he goes to Ganesh Puri and he spends um, a significant amount of time there with Nityananda until the end of Nityananda's life. Uh, so the main ashram for uh, what is now called Siddha Yoga is 
in Ganesh Puri. And there are two other main ashrams that were built. One was in New York and one is in Oakland, California. So if things open up again, <laughs> you can always swing by to the, the Oakland uh, City Yoga Center. Okay. Uh, Rudrananda, who is actually a New York Jew, uh, in the, the mid 20th century met Muktananda, which changed his life. And this is the fellow who brought Muktananda down to the United States for the very first time in the 1970s. And he built uh, his, and was initiated and built an ashram in New York City. He is the teacher of Swami Kacharanaka, uh, more affectionately known as Nataji, who is the, the head honcho, the head guru over at the Rudramandir, in Berkeley, where you guys are. Um, and this is who invited me to go on pilgrimage uh, with the Rudrananda Sampradaya. Okay, any questions so far about all this stuff before I move on to the more uh, exciting stuff? <laughs> We're all good? Okay, all right, so uh, so that's all context. What we move on here now is to, um, really looking at uh, how Shakti is moving. Shakti is want to move, it is her nature. How she moves through guru, how she moves through place, and not just how she moves through, how she is these things. Um, how she manifests as image and materiality and how she makes herself known as the, the very fiber of one's being. Okay. So Rudra Shakti, um, literally, translated as the power of Rudra. Rudra is an epithet of Shiva, so it means the power of Shiva. You can keep following that metaphoric line down with the names going from Rudra to Shiva. Shiva meaning consciousness, consciousness, consciousness meaning the, um, the essence of the self, so the power of the real self. This here is an image of Nataji um, giving pranams to uh, Nityananda. This is Nityananda's bedroom in his house in Ganesh Puri, a uh, very sacred sacred place. Okay, so what is Rudra Shakti and why is it so important? Rudra Shakti is understood as um, the power of Shiva, um, the power of the lineage really, that flows through the lifeblood and the energy of the teacher. And it is Rudra Shakti that passes from teacher to disciple. Um, the Malini Vijaya Uttara Tantra says, in the Trika, initiation requires one of the modes of penetration by Rudra Shakti, known as Samavesha, or complete absorption. In the, in the school, or in the family, it is a state of automatism, in which it is the possessing deity that moves one's limbs. In the Kaula, again, family, it is a state of spontaneous fusion with the consciousness of the initiator. Uh, to summarize that, basically means that one sacrifices their whole being, their whole body, and their whole self to the divine, to the extent that it is the divine that is acting, not the individual. Okay. All right, so there are, um, so what Muktananda did, what I would say one of his uh, larger gifts to the lineage was that he was able to contextualize a lot of the teachings and the presence of uh, Bhagavan Nityananda to the world. Because Nityananda did not uh, subscribe to any particular religious tradition, uh, his teachings could have been interpreted in a multitude of ways. So, so what Muktananda did was he was a very educated, erudite individual. He started to investigate a lot of the texts from both the Upanishads and also from the Tantric tradition and started to, to give more of a textual authority to some of the actions of Bhagavan Nityananda. Uh, and one of those actions was actually just to look at people. And so some of you have heard the term darshan, which means sacred seeing, uh, which is a very key component of this research here, because I am dealing with images in material culture and the very faculty of sight, how we imbibe the spirit through just looking. And it, this was one of his gifts. Uh, one of his devotees said that, that Bade Baba, which means uh, big daddy actually, <laughs> um, would just look at all the people. He would hardly talk. He might at times give you very short instructions just so the queue would move because there were so many people coming to see him. If you just glanced at him, 
um, and I think this was a, a miswrite uh, in the book that I took this out of, um, he would come and settle in your heart. We people could not look at him. There was so much radiance. Uh, Muktananda also said that his darshan, his sacred sight, uh, the experience of seeing him and receiving his blessing emanating from his silent presence was the focus of all activity. Um, and then by the, the mid 50s, uh, hundreds of people were coming to see Nityananda. And so sometimes some people just felt satisfied just looking at his back um, while he was turned away from him. So it was just the, that Rudra Shakti that was flowing through Nityananda that seemed to um, heal people in profound ways. All right, so Shakti as place. Oops, did I miss something? Oh, I didn't, it's okay. So this here, um, we'll come back to this image in a little bit. This is the main shrine for Bhagavan Nityananda. It is one of the centers of the, um, the whole town. The whole town itself is a pilgrimage site. And here we see uh, the beginning of the Guru procession, which happens once a week in Ganesh Puri, uh, usually at around sunset. It's called the Palki procession. And Ganesh Puri uh, is not like the neighboring towns, certainly nothing like Mumbai, which is just about two hours away by car. Um, there are no bars here. There are no theaters here. Um, I don't even think you could buy like a box of cigarettes. Um, so it is very much uh, a, a town that is infused with this kind of sort of spiritual purity because of Nityananda's presence. So really the only action uh, at all is uh, these site visits and also the Palki procession, the Guru procession. And I had a super hard time getting close enough to get some really good footage here um, so there's, um, and there's no photography, obviously, inside the, the temple. So I couldn't do that. But uh, they have a little mini Nityananda uh, Murti that they take and they put inside this, I don't know what you call that thing. There's a special name for it. Somebody please tell me. It's like the chariot where they, they mm -hmm. kind of carry the, the royalty in. And so the, the mini Murti is placed in there. And it is processed through the town and all the towns people come there's drums and singing and chanting and offerings are given to the Murti or through to the guru and here again this is like as close as i could come without being a major a-hole to uh, everybody else it was sort of a a pushing and, sh and shoving kind of scene and i i definitely did not want to um bar anybody's movement, especially since I was taking pictures and not necessarily um, giving pranams. I did try to get a little bit of a video here. And this is uh, an image of the procession just as it's leaving the temple. Sorry, it looks like an intoxicated person took that video. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. <laughs> oh, whoops. Okay. Um, so that was uh, Shakti is manifesting as guru and how people are really, uh, devotees are coming all the way um, from very far away, so many places in the world to partake in the blessing of the guru, uh, which is still very, very active um, in Ganesh Puri. And anything that was touched by this divine Shakti um, in this town and in the neighboring towns um, is also understood as being um, infused with this kind of spiritual power and able to offer in some small way or large way uh, a bit of liberation. So here we see Shakti as place. The center of what I deem to be the place is Ganesh Puri, although there are a lot of outer lying areas and towns where we see a lot of divine activity going on. So this is um, Kailas, and this was his longest period of his longest time home in Ganeshpuri. 
Okay, so I'm going to start with um, just some photos of what is called the Nityananda Nath Mandir. And this is actually in Vajrashwari, Maharashtra, which is um, a small town. It's, it's like, a, like a 10 minute tuk-tuk ride from Ganesh Puri um, across a small river, the Tansa River, to this other town. And this is uh, reportedly where Nityananda took up his first residence. And it is quite literally a very small concrete block. Um, apparently Nityananda had an extreme fondness for sleeping on concrete um, because everywhere um, you go where he lived, um, it was a lot of concrete. Uh, and you see pictures of him just kind of sleeping or sitting on concrete. He was not a big fan of comfort, I, you know, which is awesome. And this here is a shrine that was probably most definitely installed uh, after Nityananda's residence. So I tried to get as many pictures as I could. When I, when I went into the space, um, number one, I went with a bunch of people, which was probably a mistake. And number two, there are people that come here and they like to sit and they like to meditate part of their sadhana. Um, the whole room, uh, the office that I'm sitting in now it, is probably bigger than this little house um, that Nityananda lived in. Unfortunately, you can see that there's a pulley for the, that's a, of the face there, but that's a, an image of Nityananda. It was actually a little bit of a scary house because <laughs> it was very dark inside um, and they had these kind of rickety ceiling fans going on. Uh, so, you know, you definitely have Um, later on, devotees got together and um, constructed a larger house for him, which is called Kailas. I was not allowed to take photographs at all, uh, pictures that you see here. I did what I could uh, uh, while maintaining respect and while not getting in trouble. Uh, this was a photograph that was taken right outside his bedroom window. If you recall, the, there was an image of Nataji who was kneeling down on a concrete block. Um, this is the room. This room is probably the most popular site for sadhana and meditation. People uh, come here either early in the morning at around 6 a.m. during sunup, or they come at 6 p.m. Um, during the in-between times to, to meditate. And so there is typically a person uh, who sits outside and, and just maintains the, the space while pilgrims and devotees come and pay their respects. This is right outside the bedroom. Again, more concrete blocks. Um, and there are some fa very famous images, older images of Nityananda, which I probably should have posted on this slideshow here for everyone to see. Um, and, this, and these are all maintained as meditation spots. Any meditation spot will have a mat out in front of it with the knowledge that people will be coming and kneeling down. You can see there are some, some marigolds lying on the sheets here and an, uh, a photograph of Nityananda. Uh, next on the list here is this is both temple and mausoleum. This is the site where uh, he is his buried. Uh, and this is a very potent place for sadhana and meditation, uh, especially on the days of the Palki procession. The room, his mausoleum, is, is pretty crowded with devotees. Um, they'll typically come to the mausoleum site, sit in the room here. This is not mine. I was, again, not allowed to take pictures. So I got this from the website and you can see this is on a mellow day, um, but typically you would see cushions all the way around the room uh, filled and in some cases people filling up the center here. This is actually not the place that he died. He died in one of the adjoining rooms, which are through either one of those doors um, in the back, but this is a larger room, but you can go and you can, you can look into the room in which he passed. And uh, so part of the procession starts, um, you come in through the left-hand door in the picture, um, you sit for a while, you leave through the other side and you 
pay your respects for a given time uh, at his actual, the site that he left his body and attained Mahasamadhi, the great liberation. So when we talk about place in Ganesh Puri, we're not just talking about man-made or human-made constructions. We're also talking about um, natural phenomena. Here, this is um, the Fire Mountain, um, which is, uh, you know, Ganesh Puri is such a storied place, um, as many uh, towns that rise up around saints are. And there are, there are basically stories surrounding almost every temple and every large natural phenomena. Fire Mountain is, this place is called Mandagni Mountain. And this is a little bit north of the town um, and it's named for the god Agni, um, the fire god. And I, I was reading that uh, Swami Durgananda, uh, otherwise known as Sally Kempton, she, uh, when she started to write her record uh, or her accounts of Ganesh Puri several years ago, she said that um, that locals would say that yogis still lived in its caves in the 1930s. Um, when I was there, locals were still talking about seeing little fires burning at the top of the mountain um, late at night, indicating that there, there are people still living up there. And the story goes that there are yogis living up in that mountain. I don't know how they survive. Um, some some pilgrims like to try to walk to the mountain, uh, which is actually really dangerous. There's, the terrain is not so bad in Ganesh Puri, but the heat is oppressive. Uh, and there are some pretty vicious wild dogs. So uh, it's, we were advised that if we wanna go on that hike to, um, especially as a woman, to have a, a couple of men along with us. Um, Typically, I'd get irritated by something like that, but this time, you know, I was all right. <laughs> I decided I would, I would skip the hike to the mountain <laughs> and enjoy it from afar. Let's see. All right, so another um, natural, natural source of Shakti is the Tansa River. Uh, this is also where the hot springs are, uh, the storied hot springs that, um, because of the, the sulfur under the ground, um, they're, they're a, a a bit aromatic, um, but this is also where <laughs> uh, Swami Muktananda liked to bathe. Uh, so again, a great pilgrimage. Well, I did not find it terribly pleasant because it was extremely hot, um, but you know, that's just me. Okay, so uh, Shakti as matter and as Murti. So a lot of these categories here, obviously um, you can see this big Venn diagram forming where everything is overlapping and that is Shakti. And so Shakti is moving from the spirit as guru into the earth and into the places that the guru touches. And then finally into um, some of these other elements here. So here we see the, um, the Shivalinga, the oblong, feature on the right, sitting in the yoni, which is Shakti, the womb, and on the left-hand side, Nandi. So also other indicators of, um, of Shakti here. Uh, Ganesh Puri and the surrounding towns are full of Shaiva symbolism and Shakti symbolism. Uh, I was actually really blown away by it. When I came from Mumbai, which is really sort of just everything and anything in terms of sectarian affiliation, um, it was interesting to see that Ganesh Puri really, really very much is focused um, on Shiva and Shakti, for sure. The, the foundation of Ganesh Puri, like I said earlier, um, is, is sort of built upon Adivasi culture or local tribal culture. And this was not lost on Nityananda. Um, he cared for the Adivasis very, very much. Um, and so if you kind of peel away the surface of a lot of the, um, the temple worship, you see a, a Shakta practice that is going on uh, in Ganesh Puri. And this is to Godevi, village goddess, that's all that means. And it's just a, a small little pindi form, a little rock here. The villagers are right now, well, probably not right now, but in, as of maybe like a month onto businesses in Ganesh Puri to collect money 
so that they could start to build a temple to the village goddess. Here's a close up of her form, very sweet um, and maintained. These are fresh flowers. Um, a gentleman sits here every day uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, vandals aren't coming and tearing things apart. Although there's not a lot of crime in Ganesh Puri, it's a very, very safe town. Um, make sure that the oil lamps are lit and full, keeping it clean. Here we see um, just some ruins that villagers, the Adivasis, uh, have brought. And Vajreshwari, the Yogini temple. Uh, this temple and this deity, Vajrashwari, was very active prior to Nityananda's presence in Ganesh Puri. And this is an active pilgrimage site, obviously. You see this here. This is another one of the big draws of the town. Oh, we saw that already. So again, uh, lots of, uh, this one's quite lovely, lots of Shaiva symbolism everywhere. And around the temple, there are multiple opportunities to worship the divine in the form of Shiva. So that from the moment you step on the steps of the temple, you are always being reminded of God. This was the one picture I could take of Vajrashwari, the three, the triple-headed goddess. Um, she is the, the goddess of the thunderbolt who reportedly saved the town from destruction. So she's very revered here. Um, and right above this is a tree. And this is something that I found especially, um, spe uh, very special, was that a lot of the major temples here do not kind of bowl over nature. They're built up around nature, which I found, I found quite nice. Um, and I'm not sure if that's common practice. I did not see it in some of the temples in Mumbai, obviously, but I did see it in most of the goddess temples. Outside, lots of pictures of outside because I couldn't take pictures inside. And then on the way back down. Um, I don't remember what day this was, but um, as you can see, everybody's um, gets really dressed up uh, to go to temple. And there's, um, a, I didn't get a picture of this, which I should have. There's a gentleman in the back who sells devotional saris or for, for prasad for the goddess. So you go, you buy a sari for her um, and you give it to the pujari. And once every so often the saris are collected and then they are given to a nonprofit agency that helps the empowerment of the Adivasi women. And so they take those saris and they sew them into crafts and other varieties of kinds of things um, to sell internationally. And a lot of this stuff was actually started by Nityananda, some of, the, some of these activities. And they are continued in his name. So the Nityananda Shrine, we'll look at some of the um, we've already seen this, but I wanted to focus more on the Mortis in here. Um, uh, well, I have to show the tree because that is part of the, the devotion here. So this is um, obviously can't take pictures, but this is a very fuzzy, I apologize, a reproduction of a photograph taken of Nityananda's Morti which is gilded in, in brass. Um, this is basically what it looks like day in and day out. And so for Guru Purima, the celebration of the Guru, uh, this is what happens. You guys should stop me, it's 9.45. Ooh. <laughs> Do you want to go to questions, Laura, or do you still have more to, to show? Oh. 
Did you say something, Lydia? Yes. <laughs> I'm okay. wondering, do you still have more slides to show us? Yeah, I'll, I'll just run through them really fast. Okay, fantastic. Um, and then I'll, I'll be done. Okay, um, yes. Uh, so here we've got, um, when we're talking about materiality, um, we're moving from you know the, the mountain and the river, and we're moving here now to a spiritual economy, right? So um, because so many pilgrims uh, have been coming to Ganesh Puri for several decades now, a spiritual economy has sprouted up around the, the temple grounds and throughout the whole entire town. Uh, and in, ma in many ways, it's the main f form of gener generating income for people. Uh, and there are about 10 little shops exactly like this. Mm -hmm. They're all pretty much the same. I really did not understand why some shops were more popular than others. Uh, but people will say that, go to so-and-so's shop, not don't go to these other shops. So I'm not sure why that was, but because um, they all looked pretty identical to me. Um, I think some people were just more open to bargaining. I think that might have been the might have been the key. Um, and even the you know the little snack shops or the ice cream stands. Um, almost every single one is named for Nityananda or Muktananda. Um, not so much Guru Mai, uh, who is another lineage holder of this the the Siddha Yoga lineage, Nitya Puja, right? And these are business cards that I received, um, and uh, they're an attempt to show some kind of connection to the, the guru here. Uh, the one on the right was, was very sweet. Um, the woman that gave it to me said that that little baby was her husband's father. Um, <laughs> and so uh, it kind of validates the... the uh, this shrine here is also very special. It was the only shrine that was commissioned by Nityananda, and this is Bhadrakali here. She is different because he wanted her different. Uh, she is not fierce the way Kali is typically fierce. Um, he wanted her with only two arms and to be light blue and to be dressed. Um, it's a very small place, also very powerful. I'm not lying. I was not allowed to take any pictures. <laughs> All right, and this is the outside of the, the shrine. I went to this one almost every day. Um, and usually the steps are like kind of littered with people who are um, giving their devotions. And people of all religions uh, would come here to give devotion to, to Ma, which I thought was very special. And then Shakti itself, imbibing the spirit through sadhana. Um, so just very briefly, um, the practices, on retreat were to be in some form of quiet contemplation formally uh, uh, in the ashram for about six hours a day. Um, and so upon, I'm just gonna run through these while I talk so I can wrap up. Um, upon uh, hearing that, I figured on my off time, the last thing that I would wanna do was, was to be in more sadhana, to be in more contemplation. But one finds, that in this kind of environment, the uh, one is compelled to be in a state of internalization almost constantly. Every time you go to a site, um, here's the, the Garbhagriha of the Atmalingeshwar Mandir, uh, which is the, the inner sanctum. I actually was allowed to take pictures here, which blew my mind. Um, And here, both Shiva, uh, one is the anaconic Pindi form in close up with the milk offerings. Very beautiful. And mini pilgrimages here as well. So anytime you leave the, the, the ashram to go do something other than practice, you find yourself engaging in another kind of practice. If you want to see anything, um, that, that seeing, that activity is cloaked in more sadhana. Like I wanted to see the Ganesh stations. So in order to do that, I had to do this mini climb up a hill, um, which is its own form of sadhana. This is the, the main one. At the very top here, we see Shiva and Parvati, Durga in the background, and Nityananda on the side. All right, thank you, Care, for everything. 
Um, sorry, that was so long. <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much, Laura. Sure. Do we have time for questions? We comments? do, yes. Please. Okay. Laura, do you know why uh, Nityananda wanted um, Badr Kali to be represented in a more gentle form? I don't know in any verifiable way, although uh, a lot of previous scholarship has shown that there is some connection between that representation and, uh, and Tamil Nadu, which is where they think he might have come from. Yeah. Um, I don't have a, a question exactly, but I just wanted to say I really, um, you said, well, let's move on to the more exciting part after you gave the, the sort of context and the historical context. But I thought you did a great job with that. It was really helpful. Yeah. Really clear, you know, who was who and who are the cast of characters we needed to know. So. And then I also wanted to say that in the end, when you, that description you just gave about how sadhana can't be avoided, you know, you're compelled into it. I think there's, it's really, really interesting to think about that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't think, I mean, it completely changed my understanding of the tradition mm -hmm. to be immersed in that environment um, in the best of ways. Um, and there are so many things that I could not put in a slideshow like one of the things that I really wanted to talk about, but this really wasn't a sociological study as such, so I didn't feel proper talking about it. I can just do it casually though, which is just um, the, the townspeople. And I think Kathleen can probably attest to that. Like there is this, there is seems to be some kind of the spirit of Nityananda that is living on through all mm -hmm. of these people. Um, I was very, very struck, struck by it and even more struck by it when I had to go back into the city. Um, and, and you see that, um, like, wow, um, it's just crazy different, crazy different. It's really interesting. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, this was wonderful, Laura. And I, I tuned in a few minutes late, so you might have said this, but where are you in the process of moving toward your dissertation from what you learned in this field work? Um, how much does this shape your dissertation? Have you proposed already? Um, I have proposed yesterday or Wednesday, um, and so now, yay, <laughs> yay for me, ABD. Um, uh, what what it does for me um, is it gives me that provides me with that immersive experience. Certainly, like what Dr. Sharma had spoken about um, in her writing. Uh, but beyond that, one of the things that I didn't really want to get into, at least now, is the struggle that West some of the material culture. Um, so much time was spent um, by Western pilgrims trying to contextualize information. Um, and it's not to say that that process took away from the experience, but it raised a lot of questions about when you have that gap in knowledge, that gap in understanding, um, the kind of work that needs to be done in addition to the sadhana, in addition to the sitting, um, and, and what role that sort of contextual understanding plays in the, in the cultivation of a tantric experience. So that's kind of where I'm at now with that. Laura, I wanted to ask the uh, relationship of uh, Rudrananda to um, Muktananda, their guru bhais. Mm -hmm. But were they, um, did they just take two different tracks? I don't, I don't think so. Um, I almost like, the story is a little bit hazy. Um, well, number one, Rudy died very young. And so whatever kind of uh, maturity in the lineage that he would have had, I don't think he ever made it. Uh, died in a plane crash in his 40s. Um, yeah, and so uh, Nataji, as a result, um, I think ended up practicing with Muktananda and then with another one of his students, Chetananda. 
And so at this point in time, we see, um, I don't want to call it a disillusion, but there's a fracturing of lineage because of Rudy's death. And so it's a little bit harder to trace. I know that Nantaji has made a point of asserting that the lineage that he traces is through Rudy and Nityananda. And I'm sure there's a larger story there, but I'll have to um, have more conversations with Nantaji to clarify that, the rationale for that. Thank you. You're welcome. So the chariot, I'm just looking, the chariot is called Pali, not sure what you would call it in India. Oh, okay. Rat. Rat. Ah, the Rat Yatra. Hmm. The Palki, the Palki is um, basically a small, um, not chariot, but what's the English word for when you have something and you carry it on two poles. Sedan chair. Sedan chair. It's, a uh, sedan. Yeah, it's like a sedan okay. chair. But, okay. um, but it, except it's flat, you know. But um, when, when, you, when you kind of uh, see it as a metaphor for a chariot, then it's rut. It means chari rut uh, okay. chariot. Okay. And, um, Yatra is, is journey, but Yatra is associated with the concept of pilgrimage. So okay. when, when, when you take um, the chariot from one location to another, even if it's from one temple to another, that is considered a pilgrimage. Um, and you know, then you return it. And that whole process is, even if it's like one mile, it, it's a pilgrimage and it's called uh, Yatra. Yeah. The okay. most famous of this is in Puri with Jagannath. But. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to comment that I loved your approach to the materiality and the immersive experience. And I hope, and I, and I seen a little bit of this, but I really hope that these approaches are being used in other religions because as neatly as it fits with Hinduism, I think that Buddhism and Shinto and Taoism are very, very strong parallels to this. And so sure. I hope you can shape the field and how we approach Yeah, it. well, that, that is the basis of the dissertation okay. is to... Unfortunately, in a lot of East Asian stuff, what I've seen is more the economics of materiality of religion, but this is fascinating. So I, your, your methodology just was really very good. Thank you so much, appreciate that. Indeed, it is groundbreaking. Mm. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, thank I you hope so I see Laura. you guys all in person one day soon. Yes, we could all come to Hawaii. You can. You'll have to quarantine for 14 days and they'll throw you in the clink if you break it. <laughs> Laura, Which is kind I, of not funny. I want to say, Laura, on behalf of CARE, we're, so it's always very exciting to see what students do with the grant money that we're able to assist with. And this was another case of, you know, feeling like our uh, contribution to your uh, research was was money well spent so yeah. good I'm so I happy to hear that I'm very happy to hear that and I'm so grateful that um, you guys are there and supporting us um, I'm always going to be a big advocate absolutely excellent thanks everyone thank, thank, you. You. thank you thank you take good care bye everybody thank you bye, bye.